Good afternoon, everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone on Zoom and in person for joining us today for our MCHRI seminar. Uh, my name is Mary Chen, and on behalf of the MCHRI Education Committee, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we just have a few announcements before we get to our uh, speakers today. And just wanted to acknowledge our MCHRI Education Committee um, who put on all of the education seminars and programming for MCHRI. If you are interested in joining us, we would love for you to reach out. And for next month, uh, this is our seminar. It will be virtual uh, using digital imaging for monitoring skin disease. Uh, I hope you can join us for that. Next slide. And also something new that um, is uh, fairly uh, recent that we've started doing is uh, community engaged research uh, education. And there is a seminar also coming up next week on March 16th. This will be a virtual workshop. It's a really good foundational uh, seminar for those of you who are not as familiar with uh, community engaged research. We hope you can join us for that. And of course, our annual symposium uh, is coming in October, and this is going to be in person at LKSC, and uh, it's really a great community event, and we hope uh, you can all join us there as well. And of course, that leads us to today. Uh, we have uh, a great seminar lineup for you, the Warburg Effect, How to Cure Cancer with Metabolic Therapy. And we're gonna first have Dr. John B. Ye, uh, and then uh, Hao Wen Zhang, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic. Right, thank you, Mary, for the great introduction. And I uh, also want to thank MCHI and Nita for organizing this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, it's our great pleasure to share our research here. Okay. Uh, so uh, our lab is in the Department of Radiation Oncology, uh, Stanford. Uh, we don't really study radiation. Uh, instead, we study cancer metabolism. Well, since uh, I started my lab here at Stanford, uh, we have been interested in understanding the cause and the consequence of the Warby effect and how to reverse the Warby effect uh, with metabolic therapy to kill cancer. The Warby effect was discovered by Otto Warburger, the German physician scientist and Nobel laureate, uh, in about 100 years ago. I personally worship him not only because he discovered Warby effect, so I have something to work on, but also because he has extraordinary ability to write grant applications. So this is one of uh, his original grant proposal. It was written in Germany, and it means uh, I need 10,000 marks. And it was fully funding. I always hope I can write a grant like that. The first publication on the Warby effect was uh, published on 1924. So this year is the 100 year anniversary of this discovery. Unfortunately, most of people in the field who study Warby effect and the cancer metabolism still consider that the Warby effect is simply a metabolic hallmark of all cancer cells. However, uh, very few people including Warburg himself and our lab, we believe that the Warburg effect is actually the prime cause of tumor genetics. It's very easy to describe the Warburg effect. Our normal cells convert glucose in the presence of oxygen into CO2 and water, generating a lot of ATP. But for tumor cells, they convert majority of glucose into lactate and generating much less ATP. So this seems to be a big waste, right? So there are un many unsolved questions about the Warby effect. The most important question unaddressed is, how does Warby effect promote tumor genetics? If we believe that the tumor cells just want to proliferate, then why would they waste all those carbon and energy as lactate instead of using them for biosynthesis and energy production. To answer these questions, first we have to hear from Warburg himself. In 1956, uh, he published this milestone review on Warburg effect. 
and Warburger himself believe that the consequence of Warburg effect is to convert normal cells into undifferentiated cells that are the tumor cells. So the Warburg effect is about the differentiation. Okay, that's the consequence of the Warburg effect. However, back then, even though he had this great hypothesis, uh, people don't understand the connection between metabolic reprogramming and cell phase change. And it's uh, our uh, goal to figure out this connection. Thanks to the recent research advance in the enhanced yeah. metabolism, <laughs> now we start having some clue. The chromatin carry all the gen genetic information consists both histone and DNA. And both histone and DNA, they can undergo dynamic modifications all the time. These modifications can alter gene expression without changing the DNA sequence. That's why they are called epigenetics. All these epigenetic modifications, they share two common features. First, they are all reversible, okay? To active gene transcription, you can use histone acetotransferase to add acetyl group on the histone. You can also use the trains and with the NAD as a separate to remove those acetylations. You can add methylations on the histone and the DNA. You can also remove those methylations with histone demethylates and DNA demethylates using RKG as substrate. Because they are reversible, so this gives cell plasticity to respond to all kinds of stimulation, adapt to the stress condition, and change their cell fate. Another common feature of all the FGN modification is that they all require small metabolites as a substrate. For instance, they need s -A for acetylation, they need NAD uh, for the acetylation, they need RKG for the methylation, and there are other metabolites that can inhibit RKG dependent mechanism. Okay, so all this can be controlled by the availability of metabolites. This is how cells use mitochondria as a metabolic sensor to regulate gene expression, cell differentiation, and cell fate. So based on this knowledge, now we can reframe the original Warburg's hypothesis. If we believe that the Warburg effect or the metabolic reprogramming is leading to the dysregulation of epigenetics and eventually cause the differentiation and tumor genesis. Then we can use metabolic therapy to block the Warburg effect, to inhibit this dysregulation of epigenetics and to reactivate differentiation and inhibit tumor genesis. So to test this hypothesis, first we need a stress condition that can induce the Warburg effect. And in this case, it's hypoxia, because we know that the cause of Warburg effect is injury of respiration. It means inhibition of mitochondrial respiration. And the easiest way to do it is remove oxygen, which is hypoxia, which is a common microenvironmental stress existing in all the solid tumor. Here we can see, once we put cells under hypoxia with low oxygen condition, is that 2% oxygen or 25% oxygen. We see the glucose consumption increase slightly here, but the Israeli lactate production increased a lot. And together, that leads to a double of the lactate production to the glucose consumption ratio. Okay. So this is a typical Warburg effect. And the system we use to test this hypothesis is a neoblastoma. Neoblastoma is a common pediatric cancer. About 50% of the patients are less than one year old. So. And more and more evidence suggests those pediatric cancer, including neoblastoma, uh, they are not genetic disease. They're more like epigenetic disease. Because all those pediatric cancer, they carry much less somatic mutation when comparing to the adult cancer. Less than 10% of the neoblastoma patient, you can identify a recurrent mutation in their uh, tumor. In some of the cases, spontaneous regression can occur okay, without any treatment. 
despite this difference, still today, lots of the pH cancer, they're still being treated with traditional therapy as adult. Surgery, radiation, chemo. Fortunately, uh, those neuroblastoma patients also respond to retinal acid-based differentiation therapy. That's why we can use this to study the differentiation. So this first work was done by our formal research scientist, Yang Li, to test the Warburg hypothesis. Uh, first, we use neuroblastoma, give them retinal acid. And here we can see, once we add retinal acid, those neuroblastoma cells, they stop proliferating and they differentiate into neuron-like cells. But once we put those cells on a hypoxia condition, those differentiation morphology disappear. So Warburger was right, okay? The induction of the Warburg effect does inhibit tumor cell differentiation. Because differentiation requires expression of certain differentiation marker. So we perform RNA analysis, trying to identify those genes that are highly induced by RA treatment, which are those red genes, but are fully repressed on the hypoxia condition. And we can see there are hundreds of those genes. Who represented ones are NGFR and SNCG. Those are established neuron differentiation markers. In patients with high expression of those differentiation markers, their survival is much better than those with low differentiation. So the better differentiation, the better outcome. And next, we want to dig into the molecular mechanism because it was known that the RA receptor require histone isotransferase as a co-activator. So the histone isolation is needed for the activation of RA signaling. So we wonder whether the histone isolation could be modulated on the hypoxia condition. And indeed, once we put cells on the hypoxia, all those histone isolation markers are reduced, including H3K9 isolation and H3K37 isolation. Those are the activation markers for gene transcription. Some of you may be wondering, where is the acetylcholine used for histone isolation coming from? The acetylcholine is first generated in the mitochondria by the uh, power weight. But this acetylcholine in the mitochondria cannot leave it in the mitochondria. It has to be first converted into citrate. And citrate can leave mitochondria through a citrate transporter. In a cell cell and a nuclear, the citrate can be converted back to acetylcholine by this enzyme called ACLY. So we performed a mass spike analysis marrying the citrate level and acetylcholine levels in the cell on hypoxia. And both of them reduce a lot on the hypoxia treatment, suggesting perhaps the reduction of the citrate and acetylcholine level is a cause of histone hypoisolation on the hypoxia. And to validate this, we perform metabolic tracing analysis using uniform c 13 labeled glucose. When label cells with uh, M plus six glucose, eventually we'll have M plus three power weight and M plus three lactate. And also we'll have M plus two acetoy and M plus two citrate. And our analysis revealed that on a hypoxic condition, both the M plus two citrate and M plus two acetoy, their fraction reduced significantly. And obviously, the M plus three lactate increased. Okay, so this is what Warburg effect is about. It's diverting the power weight flux away from the TC cycle. Instead of generating acetoy and citrate, it's used for lactate production. And what's the signaling pathway that control this conversion? It was known that the on hypoxia the stabilization of the HIF transcription factor, it can transcription induce the power weight dehydrogenase kinase one and three. PDK one and three, we can phosphorate and inhibit PDH, the power weight dehydrogenase, to block this conversion from power weight to acetylcholine. So here we can see on the hypoxia, 
false peak one and peak three, they are induced significantly. And also the protein level goes up a lot. With this induction of PDQ1, the PDH phosphorylation increased a lot. It was known that the, we can inhibit PDK activity with this drug called DCA. With increased amount of DCA, we can reduce the PDH phosphorylation. And most importantly, we can restore all those histone isolation markers on the hypoxia treatment. And this is associated with the increase of M plus two SCOA and M plus two citrate. This suggesting that the increased PDK activity is a cause of histone uh, hypoisolation. Because both PDK1 and PDK3 that are induced on a hypoxia, we wonder which one is responsible for this state differentiation. So we use SHI to knock down either PDK1 or PDK3. Uh, it's very obvious, knocking down PDK3 only reduces proliferation, but does not change the cell morphology. But it's really the knocking down PDK1 itself induces very dramatic neuron differentiation, even without RA treatment. Although the DCA can inhibit PDK and restore the histone aspiration, but it is known that the DCA requires very high concentration to work. So that's why all the clinical trials using DCA, they eventually failed. So we wonder if there's an alternative way we can restore the histone isolation. We can just give cell acetate. In the cell, this acetate can be converted into acetoid by this enzyme ACSS2. And a good thing about hypoxia is that hypoxia can also induce this enzyme. So this provides this therapeutic opportunity using acetate supplementation. Once we give cell acetate or GTA, GTA is another precursor uh, for acetate. Both of them can significantly restore all the histone isolation markers. And importantly, both acetate and GTA, they can restore those differentiation marker expression, SNCG and NGFR and hypoxia. This further confirmed that the reduction of the histone isolation was a cause of the reduction of differentiation marker. And importantly, once we give cell uh, GTA in combination with RA, now we can restore those new right formation, those differentiation morphology on the hypoxia condition. So to summarize the first part, now we know that the key of the worry effect is to block cell differentiation, promote tumor genesis through diverting power weight away from SQA generation. And a hypoxia induction of the PDK1 and 3 can phosphorate and inhibit PDH. This inhibits the conversion from power weight to SQA and reduce cellular SQA and C3 levels and reduce histone isolation, leading to the formation of hydrochromatin to silence those differentiation markers. But because hypoxia also induces ACS2, we can just give cell acetate. This can restore the cellular acetoid levels and also the active protein foundation, and also restore differentiation marker and normal cell differentiation. So that was a great start, but there are multiple questions still haven't been addressed. First, we use hypoxia to treat cells, so that can still induce a lot of lactate production. So is lactate really important? Is, if lactate is important, then we probably shouldn't have yogurt anymore. And second, are there other stress conditions that can also cause similar metabolic and epigenetic dysregulation to block differentiation? And what about other cancer types? So next, I want to introduce another metabolic stress condition that also exists in solid tumor, which is called serine starvation. Serine is a non-essential amino acid, and its level in solid tumor is usually very low, especially in breast cancer. So previously, uh, this is the first study I did during my postdoc training. I found serine is very, serine starvation can induce the anti-wobble effect. Once we reduce serine level, 
uh, in the cell culture. We can see the glucose consumption does not change too much, but it's really the lactate production reduced a lot. Okay, the lactate to uh, glucose consumption ratio start from about two, which is typical Warby effect, and eventually reduce to one. Okay, so this looks like an anti Warby effect. This means at least half of the glucose carbon they are not used for generating lactate anymore. And eventually, you found uh, it's because the serine is the allosteric activator of PKM2. Okay, so once the serine level is reduced, the PKM2 activity is inhibited. So the glycolysis is brought from here. It's, so the upstream glycolysis pathway, the, those intermediates, are accumulated, including 3 phosphoglycerate. And this is precursor for serine biosynthesis. So on a serine starvation, uh, half of the group's carbon they are diverted into the serine biosynthesis pathway instead of using uh, for the lactate production. So we think this is great condition for us to test the, this, whether this anti wobble effect can regulate the epigenetic change and differentiation. So because uh, it was known that the serine starvation was found in breast cancer, so we treated the certain uh, breast cancer cells uh, with serine starvation. This was, was done by my former uh, graduate student, Albert. And what he found is that those in, among those th uh, top down regulated pathways, the estrogen response pathway is one signaling pathway that is reduced by the serine starvation. And this is very interesting, okay, because we know that for most of breast cancer patients, first, when they are diagnosed with breast cancer, usually they are ER and PR positive. And after hormone therapy, some of the patients will become ER PR negative and eventually become triple negative if they also lost the HER2 receptor. The triple negative breast cancer is very aggressive and metastatic, very hard to treat. Although it has been known that the ER positive cancer is becoming ER negative patient, but we don't know what's the trigger. And here we know that the serine starvation is a metabolic trigger that can promote this conversion. And we also validated this discovery with uh, qPCR and Western blood. Here we can see both ER and PR expression were significantly reduced upon serine starvation. And so similarly, we wonder whether this ER silencing upon serine starvation was caused by epigenetic change. So we block for all the epigenetic markers, uh, common epigenetic marker we see. And here we can see associated with ER loss, it's the H3 K27 acetylation that is reduced dramatically under serine starvation condition. And we know that the loss of histone acetylation marker is responsible for the serine, uh, for the ER loss. Because if we give a uh, histone, uh, we give cell HDAC inhibitors to restore the histone acetylation we can restore the expression of both ER and PR. And next, we wonder whether this uh, epigenetic change, again, is caused by metabolic change. So we did metabolic profiling under serine starvation. As I mentioned before, under serine starvation, because PKM2 activity is inhibited, so you will have an accumulation of upstream glycolysis intermediates from G6P, to PEP, okay, and indeed it happens. But because glycolysis is brought from here, all the lower glycolysis uh, metabolites, such as pyruvate and lactate, they all reduced a lot under serine starvation. And because the cell do not have sufficient pyruvate, so they do not generate enough s citrate and all the other TC cycle metabolites. If we perform a tracing analysis, uh, similar to what we did on the hypoxia condition, and here we can see the M plus two labeled citrate and M plus two labeled as koi, they also reduce significantly under serine starvation. And this pattern is very similar to what we observed on the hypoxia condition. 
So serious starvation and hypoxia, both of them, they reduce the pyruvate flux into the TC cycle to reduce acetoy and citrate to reduce histone isolation. And next, we wonder whether we can restore this histone hypoisolation with acetate again. And indeed, if we give cell GTA, the acetate precursor, we can restore the MR level of both ER and TR. We can restore the histone isolation, and we can also restore the ER expression again on the serious starvation. So to summarize the second part, although on the serious starvation, it generate less lactate. But intrinsically, okay, it's not anti-warby effect. It's still the warby effect. It's still silencing those cell lineage specific marker by reducing histone isolation. And similar to hypoxia, we can still restore those differentiation markers by giving cell acetate. Okay, so the first part of this talk I talk about how the on the acute stress condition, such as hypoxia and serious starvation, and uh, tumor cells reduce the pyruvate flux into acetoid generation to induce histone hypoisolation and uh, silence differentiation marker. But for all those already established tumor, there's another epigenetic modification called DNA isolation, which is more stable, more inheritable and has more long-term and permanent effect on cell differentiation and cell phase change. And it was known that the in tumor with those mutations, such as IDH mutation, the fumarate hydratase loss, succinate dehydrogenase, those tumor will accumulate those so-called oncometabites, such as 2HG, fumarate, and succinate. And also hypoxia can induce the L2HG production as well. And those metabolites, because they share a similar structure as RPKG, they can inhibit all the RPKG dependent demonstrates and causing histone and DNA hypermethylation to silence the tumor suppressor and differentiation marker. Uh, so, next, our postdoc, Hao Wenjiang, and he will talk about how we use metabolic therapy to reverse the Wobi effect and tumor, promote tumor differentiation by inhibiting the DNA methylation. Thank you, Jiaming, for the introduction. And I also want to thank the MCHRI and organizer for this great opportunity. It's my pleasure to share my work today, how to reverse the world effect to promote human differentiation. First, what is causing the world effect? Essentially, the world effect is causing by inhibition of the electron transfer, transfer chain, ETC. Because the ETC is the primary spot to regenerate, to oxidate NADH, to regenerate NAD. Therefore, ETC inhibition will lead to a lower intracellular NAD to NADH ratio. And this was also confirmed by other study that indeed, compared to primary cell, cancer cell have lower NAD to NADH ratio. But how could this ratio lead to cell deep differentiation, cell phase changing? Firstly, people consider pyroleptate accumulation is a hormone warp effect, which is causing by LDH accumulation. However, it's important to know that LDH is a catalyst. A catalyst only changes the speed of the reaction rather than the equipment, chemical equivalent of reaction. What really changing the chemical equivalent actually is the substrate concentration. In this case, that's NAD to NADH ratio. So lower intracellular NAD to NADH ratio lead to lower pyruvate lactate ratio. That's what people see as a warp effect. However, the intracellular NAD to NADH ratio is not only controlling pyruvate lactate ratio, but also controlling alpha kg to twitch ratio, alpha kg, alpha ketone glutarate. It's a substrate for all the RFKG dependent dioxygenase, such as PEP, DNA demophilase, and PhD, choline hydroxylate. However, under low NAD to energy condition, alpha KG will be converted into L2G to hydroxyglutarate. 
which is a famous NCO metabolite, well known as an inhibitor of, P of PAP and PSD. Inhibition of PAP will lead to PA hypermorphylation, to silencing those tumor suppression and differentiation marker. Why inhibition of PSD will lead to HIV accumulation to activate the HIV target gene and stem stream. This transcriptional changing leads to cell phase changing. That is cell D differentiation. Based on this theory, we form our hypothesis to reactivate the tumor differentiation required to promote DA demyelination, which is dependent on the intracellular RKG to H ratio. As I discussed previously, the RKG to H ratio is controlled by the NAD to N ratio, which is coupled to ETC activity. Therefore, to activate tumor differentiation, we, ne we need to activate the ETC. So the next question is, how can we activate the ETC? Through long-term screening, we identify malconstrant coupler could be one of the possible answer. Here's how it works. So the ETC oxidates NADH to generate energy to build up this proton gradient. The ATP synthesis use this proton gradient to make ATP. This is how ETC coupled with ATP synthesis. However, when the ATP synthesis activity is low, the high proton gradient will inhibit the ETC's activity. So based on this theory, we use mitochondria and coupler to reduce the proton ingredient, in turn, activate the ADC's activity. The mitochondria and coupler we use here is NEN, nicosamine epinolamine. Nicosamine is, uh, is an FDA-approved medicine to treat L1 infection with very excellent safely profiling. The, ad, the, the adult could take about two grams per day, the children could take about one gram per day. Epinolamine is a sore form to improve its bioavailability. So the first thing we do is just treat the cell with the uh, uncoupler in the end and look, and look at the intracellular metabolism changing using our LCMS system. Indeed, we find that uh, uncoupled treatment increases intracellular NAD to entry ratio, as well as pyruvate to leptin ratio, a sign of reversing of the water effect. And more importantly, we find that NEN treatment increases intracellular RKG level and RKG to twitch level. To confirm this is due to mitochondria and coupling, we also use another mitochondria and coupler, BAM15 to treat the cell. And indeed, everything shows similar effect as uh, an year. So based on Warburg's theories, the consequence of the Warburg effect is cell D differentiation. If we are able to reverse the Warburg effect, could we reactivate the tumor differentiation? Indeed, that's what we see at least in cell model first. We treat the neuroblastoma cell with an year we see significant neuron differentiation before changing, before it's changing. It turning the new neuroblastoma cell back, back to neuron like cell. Consistent to the uh, um, before it's changing, I think we saw show that NEN treatment of regular tons of gene that uh, strongly associated with neuron differentiation. Next, we want to understand how and the end contribute to this transcriptional changing. One easy hypothesis that we have is related to DNA methylation, because I think most people agree that DNA methylation in the promoter region silencing those gene expression. So we hypothesize that NEA might remove those methylation in the promoter region. To test this hypothesis, we use FDDA methylation array. And indeed, we see that uh, NEN treatment reduced the demethylation in the CPG island, especially in the promoter region. And this region is strongly associated with the neuron differentiation gene. This exciting data suggests that mitochondria uncoupling 
promote DNA demethylation in the promoter of the new one differentiation of the new one differentiation gene. In turn, activate the new one differentiation program. In the other hand, we also observe that mitochondrial coupler induce cell cycle arrest, which is associated with new one differentiation. And consistent to the cell cycle arrest, we, uh, we see the NN directly uh, many genes that associate with uh, cell cycle progression, DNA replication. More importantly, we find that NN treatment reduce a mix in MI level and potent level. A mix is a primary amplified my uh, uncle driver in neuroblastoma, which is strongly associated with unfavorable prognosis. And consistent to the amine reduction, we see that amine treatment reduces the gene expression of the amine target gene. So to further test the amine effect in vivo, we collaboration with Dr. Bilzu's lab and his fantastic team use their optropic neuroblastoma model. This is how we do it. Basically, we inject the neuroblastoma cell into the acino gland of the mice. Well, is the neuroblastoma should naturally locate it. Then we keep monitor the size of the tumor by ultrasound. Once tumor size, once the tumor size, which uh, once the tumor which a certain size, we start ra randomly enroll it into either control dye group of the dye contained uh, uh, here. Then we keep monitor the tumor go twice a week by the ultrasound until the tumor reach the uh, sacrifice criteria. And excitingly, we find that any uh, uh, diarrhea, any intervention, they can reduce the tumor goal and prolong the survival of the mice. To further uh, understand how does any affect the histology feature of the tumor, we collaborate with Dr. Hughes' mother and his wonderful team. We find that any treatments can reduce this enlarged new cure in the xenograph. This this enlarged synovar is a, it's a sign of unfavorable prognosis of the neuroblastoma. And more importantly, we find that NEN diarrhea, NEN treatment reduce the potent expression in the xenograph of the tumor, which in line with our in vivo data. This makes us very exciting because MIG is a very difficult gene to target because it don't have M size activity. This could be an important way to target the MIG. Another thing I want to point out is the treatment shift the trans gene expression profiling to towards a much favorable prognosis direction. Here's how I do it. There's, there's total about 11 independent new data uh, patient database in R2 with prognosis information. By one thing, uh, Katamir and Lice, I basically get all the gene significant associated with either favorable prognosis and unfavorable prognosis. So because that's 11 study, I generate 11 favorable prognosis gene set and 11 unfavorable gene set. And then I define them into the G GSE, uh, GS GSE software and co-analyze with the RSA result from NEN treaty versus control group. And excitingly, what we see here is NEN Dharmaki gene almost in which all the unfavorable pronounced gene set. In the other hand, NEN Dharmaki gene in which all the favorable pronounced gene set is indicating that NEN treatment, uh, I would use the word twin, the uh, transcriptional profiling towards a much better favorable pronounced uh, direction. Uh, all this magical thing done by my contract coupler could possible due to its multiple target effect showing by showing by us and other group that uh, nicosamide actually have multiple target for example it activate multiple tumor suppressors such as ampk 53 and meanwhile inhibit multiple oncogenic uh, pathway this result was summarized in our one of our recent review then we, that's where we believe that this is the way to go Okay, to summarize my top story is according to Warburg, the cause of cancer is inhibition of cell respiration. And the consequence is converting highly defended body cell 
to human cell, undifferentiated cell, that's human cell. And this is achieved by this what intracellular redox. Reduce intracellular pyrid to left ratio, reduce intracellular RFKG to twitch ratio, which will lead to hip accumulation, which I don't have time to bring up here, and promote DA demethylation in the promoter region of the differentiation gene, eventually lead to cell phase changing. This is what we found. Here, we use a malconstruction coupler to activate the ETC to reverse the Warby effect. And meanwhile, leading to intracellular NAD to NC ratio, and this ratio determining the ratio of pi to leptate and RPG to twist G. Eventually, it will lead to heat degradation and DA demethylation in the promoter region of the neuron differentiation gene. This transcranial changing will activate the uh, tumor differentiation program, at least including neuroblastoma. Probably we will test in other, more other cancer time. Yes, this is my part of work. Uh, I would like to keep it jumping to finalize the talk. Thank you. Okay, last, I uh, just want to mention uh, this ongoing uh, future research in our lab, uh, but in the future. So uh, first, because we discovered that the mitochondria uncoupled can induce differentiation in new blastoma. So the next logical follow-up will be combine this metabolic therapy with RA-based differentiation therapy. See if the, this combination can work better. And second, uh, we also discovered this uncoupled can significantly inhibit the uh, 3D growth and the neurosphere formation of those new blastoma cells. So we're trying to use uncoupled to target the uh, cancer stem cells and uh, metastasis. And uh, last but not least, we're also collaborating with uh, Le Chong's lab uh, using the CRISPR Cas9 system from a screen and it finds exactly lethal targets that can be eventually combined with the metabolic therapy. Uh, so I want to thank everyone in the e lab who contributed to all those uh, very interesting discoveries. So you just heard uh, Howen's talk about the mitochondria on copper effect. And the first uh, part uh, story was done by Yang Li, our former uh, research scientist. And the ER and breast cancer research was done by Arbor Lee, uh, my former graduate student. And also I want to thank my great collaborators, particularly uh, Bill Chu from the pediatric surgery and uh, Dr. Hirsch mother from the pathology. Uh, we cannot get this work done without their collaboration and uh, guidance. And um, importantly, I also want to thank uh, all my funding resource, particularly the Stanford MCHI, who have been providing us generous uh, support uh, since I started here, including the pilot grant and also the research scholar award. And last, I just want to emphasize, emphasize this thing one more. Previously, we didn't know, okay. But now we know that the pediatric cancer patient, they are very different from the adult cancer patient, okay. Those pediatric tumor, they have much less uh, mutation rate compared to the adult cancer. So they are different. Even though there's this, we know there's this difference, still all those pediatric cancer patients are still being treated with traditional therapy surgery, radiation, chemo. All those therapy, they are toxic. They have a strong side effect. This is why more than 60% of those pediatric cancer survival, they still carry at least one long-term side effect from the treatment. Okay. And some of them even develop secondary tumor from the therapy. We always say, that children are our future. So far, the investment and funding support in the pediatric cancer research is still very limited compared to those investing to adult cancer. So I hope all those funding agencies, the community and stakeholders, they can keep investing and supporting the pediatric cancer research. Once uh, we can have a real breakthrough in this direction, we may be able to save those children, save our future. 
and give them a second life. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, we like both the speakers up here so we can do some question and answer. Uh, first, we'd like to see if there's anybody in the audience uh, that might have a question. Uh, hi, this is Yuxuan Liu from uh, Kara Davis Lab. Uh, I have a question about the second, like a short story about the serum starvation in breast cancer. So have you ever like, uh, like I, I was wondering like how, how, how does the patient or like with, with breast cancer with different status of ER and PR with the serum like uh, level in their like, you know, in the patient level, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a great question. Uh, so I, I think so far we don't have a uh, metabolomics data comparing the ER positive and negative cancer, but there are multiple uh, genetic studies showing that those ER negative uh, patient, uh, particularly those triple negative patient, they have higher expression in the serum synthesis pathway. And those genes, it's known that are induced under serum starvation. So that's an indication, and perhaps those ER negative patients, they do have lower serum levels. Anybody else have any questions in the audience here? Okay, I think we have some questions in the chat. Is that right? Hi, uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please, go ahead. Thanks, Neta. So uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, it was a very promising and encouraging therapy. I have two questions. Well, my first question is, uh, can like a single acute hypoxic episode lead to Warburg effect and tumorogenesis? And my second question is, what exactly constitutes the NEN diet? Thanks. Uh, okay, so I'll answer the first question. Uh, the first question is whether single acute hypoxia uh, stress will lead to tumor genesis. Uh, so I think that's probably not the case uh, because uh, you know the cell has plasticity, but the acute hypoxic stress uh, usually the cell can recover afterwards. And it's known that in during tumor genesis, it's usually that long term chronic hypoxia eventually leads to those epigenetic change changes and uh, tumor genesis. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so for the NEN diet, so basically it's the normal diet and mixed with 2000 PPN NEN, and that's it. Do I answer your question well? Can you, can you repeat that, please? Oh, sorry if I confuse you. So the NEN diet uh, is just normal diet mixed with the NEN. So basically we send the compound to a diet company and they miss with um, they miss with us and eventually saying that. So eventually the diet contain about 0.2% uh, of the NEN. Oh, I see. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you. There are any other questions from the audience? Okay, we have some questions on chat. Okay, which one? Since glycolytic intermediates are involved in both glycolysis and glu glucogenesis, are these effects on gluconeogenesis neogenesis also what happens if you use fatty acids for energy generation yeah okay uh, thank you for this great question um so we oh yeah okay all right so the question is uh since glycolytic intermediates are involved in both glycolysis and gluconogenesis. Uh, they are wondering whether there are effects on gluconogenesis as well, and whether this happens if we use fatty acid, what happens if uh, they use high fatty acid for energy production? Um, so for the first question, um, based on what we saw, once we give cell uh, mitochondrion copper, 
it accelerates the oxidative phosphorylation. So it promotes uh, glycosis and TCCF activity. And uh, there are probably less uh, gluconogenesis activity. And the second uh, question. So we haven't looked at the fatty acid oxidation yet, okay? But uh, we, we guess that the, when we activate the TCCF activity, increase the mitochondrial respiration, probably can also contribute to the fatty acid oxidation. And this is why previously, uh, you know, last century, when for some people who go to the gym, they want to lose weight, they take mitochondria on copper, help them to burn those uh, energy, extra energy, and so they can uh, lose more weight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that time, the mitochondria on copper they had was not very safe to use. So some of them uh, eventually they got overheated, uh, caused heart failure. So that's why FDA banned those mitochondrial copper. Uh, but the, this NEN drug we use here is uh, much safer, it's FDA approved. So I think this is a much better option uh, people can try if they want to lose weight. Thank you. I can read the next question. Uh, second question from Dr. Cohen. Have you done these studies on neuroblastoma cells isolated from patients who respond or don't respond to or relapse after retinoic acid? Tumor cell lines are often dif different from tumor cells. Yeah, I think that this is a great question, but unfortunately we haven't done that. But I think from our collaborator, Dr. Busu, they have several patient die xenogram model, we are exciting to test it next. Thank you for the question. I have, que I have a question. Oh, yeah, another information I want to mention, um, the cell line we use actually is eye resistant. So probably it could provide some information that the end actually could target the cell that is eye resistant. Okay, I think we have one last question we can take from a Zoom. Go ahead. Okay, Hi. Another yes, question? yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. My question is: uh, You mentioned serine, the the role of serine metabolism in in lactate production, and uh, it affects the Warburg effect. I was wondering if uh, uh, antidepressants could interfere in this process, and if they do, if you check that, and uh, what's the how do they involve themselves in this? Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, can you please mention your question again, uh, just a little slower? Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just wondering what, uh, how antidepressants could affect uh, the, um, could affect serine depletion in your experiments? Like, like uh, since serine metabolism also has a role to play in lactate production, uh, so do. Uh, do do anti do people who take antidepressants can they benefit from this therapy or they won't be able to benefit from this? Okay, yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't tested any of those uh, antidepressant uh, agents uh, in our study yet. That okay. is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, because uh, I was because serine often is. The, is there's a reduction in serine in people with depression so uh, oh, it's okay. often it's often seen that clinically so i was just wondering if this if there is if you've studied those effects okay that's very interesting the first time i know this uh, but thank you for telling us yeah oh well, uh hopefully in the future we can look into it thank you thank you for the question and we actually have one new one and uh Maybe the last one. What is the extraction solvent for your metabolomic sample preparation? Okay, okay, I could I could take this question. So we use eighty percent acetyl nitrate is the major solvent to extract the metabolite. Of course, you know different extraction buffer actually fit for different purposes. Some other people will also use like forty percent of the uh, final, forty percent uh, acetyl nitrate, and ten percent of water. Uh, but, you know, if you want to know more about this detail, you know, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to help. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Jumping and Helwin, for a wonderful talk.